Hi, Josh here, and we're back. Last time, we partially assembled a leg and ran into a number of difficulties, mostly with the upper leg and its cap and the length of the screws required to fit everything together, as well as the overall tension. So a trip to the 3D printer has resulted in a new upper leg, lower and base section, which is both slightly longer, has the uh, tensioning carriage further in towards the belt and has appropriately sized screws for all the hardware. But we have to first clear out the support and reinstall the heat set inserts. So we'll get started. I'll begin by removing the support from the top half, which has support really only in the bolt holes, as mentioned before. And there we have all the support removed. Now we'll move on to the heat set inserts that get installed in the base. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them that need to be installed. All M3 heat set inserts. We once again have our block of scrap metal, a bunch of inserts, and a soldering iron set to 650 Fahrenheit. Now for the insert that goes into the carriage, I want to have the insert either set flush against this inside surface or pressed far down in. I'm not sure if the insert an insert will fit in this hole, so we'll check. If it doesn't, it does. So I won't be able to push this one flush, but I can insert it down in and it's gonna self-align anyway, so there's we'll just all right, so there's all our insets installed, inserts installed. Now we'll disassemble this leg from its motor so that we can install the new one. The nice part about living in New England, one nice part is that McMaster will deliver for the most part, nearly any hardware next day for very reasonable shipping prices. So now we have some M3 by four hardware for bolts, as well as some M3 by 25 or 35, which we will use for the top. Well, it was supposed to be an M3 by six, and the head is just supposed to poke out. All right, so those are attached. Now we can have the leg in, and it goes in this orientation. Curve that way. Before we install it, we'll put this, slide this insert in. And so now the insert starts out much closer to the belt, which means the bolt needs less travel. And at this point, we can install the top cap, the top of the upper leg. And here we will use the new McMaster hardware because there is a an M3 by 35. And the 35 will be sufficient to reach down into the PD100. Previously I had an M3 by 30 in the last attempt, but that was based off of a slightly earlier version iteration of this episode that was wider. And so we'll and now that it's the current width we need an M3 by 35. And Yes, that went in. And did tighten down. So there we go. And so we'll use five of those. Now 
Now for the bottom bolts here, these outer four should be M3 by sixes. That one felt like it was. If the insert isn't quite aligned with the surface, the bolts will bind going in and that one sounded like it was starting to bind a bit. So rather than strip it out, I just stopped. And it's already basically flush. All right, there's our upper leg two halves. They fit together. Now we need to see, we're definitely gonna be able to fit the, our mock-up 3D printed axle. We'll insert that now and then see about pre-tensioning with the caps. Here are the caps, so we'll get one cap at the bottom. And we'll snap that into the leg. At least attempt to. And so this was one operation which was very challenging on the old leg was doing the pre-tensioning and we'll see if I was able to make this easier with this these caps in, instead of the uh, apparently these caps don't even fit in the leg at all. Tensioning operation, bending this while putting this cap on. Let's see how easy or hard that is. Like that. Right, that wasn't too bad. Certainly a lot easier than before. This is spinning freely. The belt is already pretty tensioned, which is kind of what you want because the tensioner will make it very tight when we, as we use the tensioning car carriage. So this then has. The two flat heads that go in. The two flat head M4s. To hold. And as I mentioned, this is a just a mock-up 3D printed axle. The axle will have to be metal. That's one of the few pieces that can't be 3D printed effectively. There's no good way to 3D print an axle that can hold up to the shear loads this does. That's a bit more binder, not quite as free um, spinning as I would have expected. Something is rubbing. I think it might be, no, that's not rubbing. Feels like something against the pulley. And the belt does appear to be, I think this leg may be too wide. There's, looks like there's a, about two millimeters extra, maybe even three millimeters extra width on the pulley. And I don't think it needs to be that extra wide, which is probably allowing the pulley on the top to rub against the side of the bearing, or the side of the upper pulley. We can take off this top and verify that for sure. Anyway, before we do that, let's try tensioning. So I have uh, the longest fully threaded M3 you can get for not $5 a piece from Master. And we'll stick this in this tensioner and see if it tensions up. I'm just going to watch him to see the carriage move. And so the carriage is moving, and that's pretty tight now. So 
so that is definitely pushing the carriage in and that's a perfectly fine working tension although there's not much travel left on the bolt for having a I mean it's only got it has a fair amount more and you can put an incredible amount of tension on this since it's at an angle and has bearings and we don't really want an incredible amount of tension on it All right, so that moves freely. They still have to figure out why the belt isn't quite moving as freely as it should. There must be something mating on the upper pulley. But now we'll make a stab at putting a foot on it. We have a leg right now. I guess we'll next start by doing the foot. And then once we have a foot, we can work on the upper joints. So the foot here, um, as mentioned before, has this plastic piece, which is a solid infill part. And what we'll do is epoxy a squash ball onto it. And then this will mount onto the bottom just with two bolts, which will fit into the inserts we put, the inserts we put here into this lower leg piece. So let's get out our epoxying setup and we'll epoxy a squash ball onto this piece. To do the epoxying, I have Bob's 30 minute epoxy, which is a standard one I use for operations like this. It has a long working life, so if you have many parts to do in one go, you can. And the digital scale and the cup will let us measure it out. It can be done by volume or weight. I'll put on. gloves before working with the epoxy. I'll mix it for 60 seconds. Actually, I'll get to this. Now, I haven't done this before, so I'm just going to put a little bit of epoxy in the bottom and then rub the ball around in it to spread it up around the mating surface. And we'll see how all well that works. So I'm going to mate it with the logo side down and we'll just rub that around and yeah, it looks like it's getting to all the surface. So if I set that down in with the dot up let that sit there and this has a 30 minute working life in, in practice it, it's tacky still for maybe three hours or four hours and but we'll be able to start using it on our leg in probably only half an hour an hour or so so we'll come back in that long well i've waited a while now the epoxy is still still extremely viscous but it's good enough to move on with the rest of the working on the leg so we have our foot here with the squash ball attached and it's going to attach into the leg like so and then we either will use a six millimeter or eight millimeter bolt to attach it i'll start trying a six i think that's probably what i used well there we have it a leg At least one degree of freedom of the leg. Now this has, as I mentioned, a couple of things which we'll want to fix. At least one before we run it on a robot, which is to figure out what's causing the binding on the belt in the top. It may also be that it's time to shrink this down and with this there's definitely way more margin than is necessary around the belt. Before we do that though, let's look at the next part. The next part are the second and third axes on the leg. Uh, those I did not change as much. Uh, they were in, well, first is what I call the upper motor joint, which mates onto this knee motor and allows you to attach the leg motor to. 
this is roughly what it looked like before, which it has a, a series of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bolt holes to go through. This takes the uh, improvements that I made in the most recent Quad A1 version of this by allowing access to the bolt head. So this is just a flat surface that the bolt goes in and then mates to the QDD100 and you can access the bolt with an L wrench. Um, and it's printed in this orientation, so probably could get away with almost no support, but it's a gentle curve at the bottom because it's circular to fit the QDD100. So the support allows that to come out in a um, relatively well. The part that's different, which I'm going to have to experiment with, is the cable management, which there are some insert holes on the top face, which for a 3D printed insert or the heat set inserts, which we'll use to attach some cable mounting fixtures or additional parts that will be used for routing the cables. I'll get to that in a little bit. So that's, we still need to desupport this and try attaching it. Um, the other part of that is the joint that mates to the shoulder. And so this is also very similar to the part on the QDD100, except I'm going to try printing it in a different orientation. The QDD100 part was printed in this orientation, which necessitated a lot of support on the inside to support this upper surface. And that support left an interface layer on both the top and the bottom, which had to be relatively clear, which took uh, a good five or 10 minutes of work on each part to get it to a usable finish. With this version, I'm going to try printing it in this orientation, which we'll see how well that works. And in this orientation, the only support that's necessary is this thin ridge on either side, which leaves no support on the interior mating surfaces. This I was able to do with Prusa's paint on support feature, although probably you could have just as easily done it with a support enforcer that was a rectangular block, which might be more robust from a maintenance of the S3MF file. So what I'm going to do now is de-support, remove the support from these two parts, and we'll try fitting together and see how it works. And there we go, support removed. Let's try it on a motor and see how it works. This looks like it will fit. And so one of the challenges with the old Quad A1, since it had that uncertain support layer, it had to be relatively wide to account for how clean you could get it, which meant there was a fair amount of flex. Um, this will first attach onto one the question about this is how, if it will be strong enough and what we'll have to print it in. Um, I, Pet G is likely okay, though it'll probably have to be a denser infill than this particular version was printed with. So I think that this needs an M3 by eight, but we will look and see for the part that attaches onto the shoulder. Clear off this support debris. Looks like it was an eight, because that comes, I designed them all to come through approximately three millimeters. So we'll stick this onto a QD100. Now the front facing mount on the QDD100 actually allows you to go deeper than three millimeters. So this could easily be a M3 by 10 if we wanted to reduce the number of different Hardware length requ hardware lengths required. Right. Yeah, so that was something I was worried about. This is also going to have to be changed now, apparently, to um, not rub, which means the back face needs to. It's currently flat and square, which means it rubs against the QDD100 as it spins. That was, I was going to see if I could get away with that. And the answer is I can't. So we will have to change that. That's okay. We'll go and try the 
using this as the other motor. So this will go in. And we'll attach this as if it were an upper motor, like so. And one thing I am going to try doing in this iteration is changing the cable management. With the quad A1, the upper motor was routed like this. The cables came from inside the robot through a flexible plastic conduit and came around, made a U-turn and joined in here. And there is a fixture here to clamp the conduit to. And similarly, the cables exited from this front point and came in a long loop up to the knee motor. And that meant as the upper leg moved, this that conduit was able to flex and keep the rotation to a minimum. It's kind of unsightly to have a giant conduit. And so what I'm going to try to do this time is having the conduit from the robot come in here to this front and having the wire from this side come up and rotate through a much smaller region so it doesn't have to extend beyond the rough volume of the QDD100. I don't know if that's going to work or not, but we'll give it a try. I'll show what that hardware looks like here in a second once we install this motor and get the upper motor in installed. I believe these are M yep, these are M3x6s that are necessary for these holes. So. I also made this part be symmetric. It doesn't matter so much. It might, we might make it asymmetric in order to strengthen it up. Uh, the side where it needs the most clearance is the one on the back of the QDD100, since it has the the cut the protruding part for the controller. This side you could fill it in all the way through here, which is what the Quad A1 did. For looks and weight, I made it be asymm or symmetric this time, so it's same both directions. But there's a chance this is gonna break off near the root. I should say that the natural orientation to print this part would be vertically like this, but that would make a natural Z layer line, which would just rip apart which is why we're limited to either printing it in this orientation or this orientation, both of which put the Z layer lines in directions where there isn't going to be a lot of mechanical stress. This looks like it fits all right onto this motor. Now the upper leg, I'll remove the support from it. It doesn't have very much, just a little bit on the bottom. Now the two parts that have to fit on here are this has to attach to the upper motor, like so, and that will be, we'll see if it's with eight or 10 long bolts, eight millimeter, 10 millimeter, millimeter long bolts. See what I designed. Looks like it was either, but probably 10 would be better. We'll get out the pen. And I know it's 10 coming from here to the other motor. And it looks like I set this up where we can install them even after this is attached. Um, in some incarnations of the Quad A1, the bolts going to the 
knee motor could not be installed once this was attached already, which meant they had to be pre-positioned. But since that is not the case, I'll omit them for now and we'll stick them in later. And so this round interface is what I'm going to have to switch back to on the shoulder as well, which will just add a little bit more support at the bottom. All right, so there's that. Now this attaches to the knee motor with those like so. And so this uses seven of the M3 by seven. And as with the Quad A1s version, we have to attach those with an L wrench or an Allen key. Um, which is annoying, and actually I'm gonna... I guess that would have been a reason to get them started before. I thought I'd set these to uh, be a loose fit, which meant I could just push them down in. Yeah, you can. That's the goal, is that otherwise it'd be... It, it, it's painful to do many turns with an L wrench when you only can go through 90 degrees of rotation. And so... Those, to pop those down in where no turning is required. All right, so that's all seven. Now these fit like so, and then they get screwed down in and this part can take a while because you can only turn the Allen key through a little bit more than nine. You can maybe go about 180 degrees for some of it, and sometimes you can only go through 90 if it's down too far, depending upon how long your L wrench is. And so you just crank down. And so that they don't get cockeyed, I'm going to do a little bit on each one to keep them from cross threading. Well, there's no two ways around it. That is a tedious job. Um, it's about the same as it was in the quad A1, to be fair. But and so now we have a two degree of freedom leg. Um, close to a three degree of freedom one. Now, I'll go on a digression about cable management. And this may end up using some B-roll. Let me find the other piece. Here's the other piece. And so what I, the biggest problem the cable management on the Quad A1 was the cable between this knee motor and the upper leg motor. And the challenge is that we want this to be able to move a good amount, at least 180 degrees, more would be better, without overly stressing the cable that connects between the two of them. And different robots tackle that in different ways. The, the Quad A1 had the upper leg motor mounted in this orientation and a big loop of conduit going between the two of them, which allowed this to move almost 360 degrees, to be fair. I'm okay with less than 360 degrees, though, because in practice, going to 180 either way is all that's necessary for most locomotion. So what I'm going to try is I have a small um, channel, which will mount onto the top of the knee motor, like so, and it has a cavity which runs up through the middle and comes out this side with uh, rounded edges. I'll 
throw some cat up here to show what that cross section looks like. And that mounts here, and then the wire comes out in this direction. Then, once I remove the support from it, I have a piece here. That support was easy to pull off. which acts as a shield and a guide for the cable so that it doesn't violate its minimum bend radius. Because that's the, cha the challenge with these cables that are moving is that you can't, if you violate their minimum bend radius, they will fail rapidly. And as long as you don't, they'll be okay. And so that on the Quad A1, the conduit solution, the conduit is semi-rigid and is rated for many cycles of flexing. And so it prevents the cables inside from bending at too tight of a radius or getting pinched while not failing itself. And so what I have here is a piece with, this is mostly cosmetic, this outer flap, just to keep um, you from seeing the wire. And on the inside it has a guide which is shaped in this shape and this shape. And the wire comes up through here, it'll go into this guide and on into the into this guy. This uh, I call the upper motor cable guard. And then as this moves, the wire wraps around that uh, curved guide, preventing it from turning it too sharp of a radius. And it also can be a relatively straight length, and there'll be no cable dangling down at all. It'll just be, um, it's the same length always. And it's just a matter of how it fleck or how it's spun. And so what I want to test here first is that these pieces will attach properly, and then we'll have to make a cable that's the appropriate length and see if it fits. And I think I'll save that for the next time. Thanks for watching. As before, this is my stream of consciousness uh, designing parts uh, style of feed. If you like this video, click like and subscribe. Leave your suggestions in the comments below or come and join the MJBots Discord and discuss there. And thanks for watching.